Um, last session we had um, six months ago in last December, um, and you were the, the participated and also the lectures. Um, five countries talked about um, case studies of how they dealt um, with the embassy or inside the, attache, the economic attache um, during this period of uh, um, COVID-19, how they were, how were their daily day life here in Israel. Um, we had very interesting uh, uh, lectures with uh, Switzerland um, and Australia and El Salvador and Cyprus and uh, Canada. Um, and today we are going to hear from the Israeli side how is the uh, market looks now after the COVID-19? Where are we going to um, with our two uh, very um, interesting uh, um, uh, lectures? Um, so that's all from me um, for now. Thank all of you um, that uh, joined us. Um, I hope you will have a very interesting morning. Um, and once again, don't hesitate to contact us for anything that you need. Um, you know, challenge us um, and we are here for you for whatever uh, will be your questions. Um, so Shai, the floor is yours for this morning and uh, have a great uh, day, all of you. Thanks. Thank you, Eyal, for your kind words. Uh, and now I'm welcoming Mr. Boaz Flashman Alalov, Director of Investment and the Trade Agreements Division at Israel Ministry of Finance, who will discuss the current landscape of foreign investments in, the Israel, in Israel and the tools of the chief economist to support foreign investors. So, Eyal, uh, to Boaz, the floor is yours. Hi, uh, thank you, and uh, thank you for allowing me to speak in front of this uh, uh, great uh, crowd. Uh, and participants, um, I'm happy to be here today. Um, can I uh, share a PowerPoint presentation? Can, will it work, you sure. think? No, sure. I think you, um, can you make me a host so I can share or allow me to share? Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll take care of it, just a second. And that's fine. Until you take care of it, just let me know when. Um, I'm from the Ministry of Finance, the Chief Economist Department, um, maybe uh, some of you know us, um, the chief economist in Israel in the Ministry of Finance is res responsible for three things. One is uh, economic research. Oh, I see, I, uh, I'm a host, just a second. Can you see my uh, presentation? Yeah. Excellent. Uh, just a second. So, one, one minute. So, do you see my PowerPoint? Sorry if you're asking. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. So, um, so the chief economist department uh, has three main functions. One is economic research. We have the, the most senior economic uh, researchers um, in the ministry, maybe in the government um, sitting here and we're basically an in-house uh, 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 think tank um, or research uh, uh, facilitators um, and we provide research that, or they provide research that uh, uh, are uh, directed towards economic policy. Uh, we don't just create research for the sake of research. We aim it at, at the best practices for policy. Um, now they also, they are also in charge of, of the uh, growth estimates. And that is used to, uh, of course, to set also the, the budget eventually. The government budget. Um, another function that we have is state revenue. State revenue is uh, they're in charge of the taxation policy to do it alongside the uh, tax authority. They're also uh, they also are in charge of um, uh, tax treaties, and I'll I'll get back to that because tax treaties are super crucial for uh, foreign investors, of course. Then the third function that we have 
is the international affairs function. Uh, and we do development. We are responsible for uh, 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 collaborations and relations with international organizations such as the OECD, the IMF, the World Bank. Uh, we're also in charge of international sanctions. Um, we're also head heading the uh, last year's uh, established uh, advisory board on uh, the national security aspects of foreign investments. And we do uh, international investment and trade. That's my, uh, my division. So first I'm gonna give you really a bird's eye view of what's been going on uh, investment wise in the last year. Now, of course, we're talking about FDI, foreign direct investment. That's the indicator that is used, normally used to, to measure uh, foreign investments. And, and why do we care so much about foreign investments? And you know, why, do, why, do, um, why does the Ministry of Finance care so much? Because you see, of course, there's Invest in Israel, there's the Ministry of Economy, there are other uh, organizations within the government that care for investments. Um, I do think that us at the Ministry of Finance have uh, our unique perspective. We look at the market as a whole. We don't just look at um, inward investments. We look at both inward and outward investments. We, we see both sides of the equation because outward investment also, sometimes governments tend to, to forget about those. Outward investments have great benefits. For example, uh, about half of the Israeli export uh, uh, is reliant on, on uh, Israeli investment abroad because what Israeli companies do is they establish uh, 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 a company, a subsidiary or a branch abroad, and then they use it to reach the local markets, right? So, so um, of course, outward investments are as crucial as inward investments. And so in our, our activity, our international activity with regard to investments take uh, or takes into account both sides of this equation. And of course, FDI, there's, there's a, a lot has been said on the benefits of foreign direct investments. There's of course, uh, collaborations that bring to uh, technology spillovers. So, so you get technology transfers, whether you like it or not, sometimes you don't like it but technology is transferred. Of course, when, when foreign investments come in, that they, they bring international standards, they create more jobs. The, so we have increased productivity. That's crucial for us. We have investments that may have not occurred in infrastructure, at least not in the capacity that we see. So there's a lot of benefits for FDI, but of course that's economic research has been saying that for years. Now, um, so, if you look at 2020, um, FDI across the world has dropped. I think the average, the, the overall drop in FDI globally is about 42%. And, and you can see the figures here that, that all around the world, there's been a drop. And now 2020 figures are not done. These are estimates. Um, here, I think we've used uh, UNCTAD's estimates. That's uh, United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. And they say that only a few countries in the world, according to their data, uh, have managed to increase uh, increase FDI. I think India in 2020. I think India is one of them. I think Spain, and uh, maybe you'd be surprised or not. According to UNCTAD's numbers, Israel is also one of those um, one of those countries. So you, you can see an annual growth rate of about 13 percent in the last uh, years in FDI. Now, according to UNCTAD's numbers, there was a major increase in FDI in 2020. Um, it, it, it all depends how you measure the inward FDI. Our, we, we also keep a database here at the Chief Economist, and we have some different numbers. Um, and we think there might have been a small actually decrease, but again, it, it's, a measure, it's a matter of how you measure it. Um, but still, the, the, um, the numbers show that Israel has been doing a lot better than other countries maintaining uh, or even increasing its um, foreign direct investment, inward foreign direct investment, uh, which is good for Israel, of course. Um, and, and here you can see a breakdown 
of the um, of investments uh, in Israel uh, inward investments in 2020. And you can see, and I think that was published all over. I think since Israel in the last decade, I guess, uh, has moved more and more into the um, to move to to become more and more uh, service oriented economy. You can see that the majority of investments are uh, related to IT, uh, to technology, um, and, and that that's what kept us flowing throughout 2020. And actually, uh, you, you just saw more and more investments uh, in the IT sectors, and, and um, the figures have been uh, quite amazing. And that, uh, I, I think that move, that shift to a service, more service-oriented uh, economy is what uh, kept us doing so well. Um, so that's really a bird's eye view of, of 2020, just, just to give you a taste, right? Um, now, uh, let me break down what we do here at the Chief Economist uh, to encourage uh, foreign investment. Now, my responsibility, uh, my bread and butter, if you'd like to call it, is in bilateral investment treaties. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to those in a minute. We also have tax treaties that are truly crucial for investors. Um, we have what we call the financial protocols. That's actually not in the chief economist, but we cooperate with uh, the accountant general here. Uh, that's actually uh, um, an instrument to finance uh, trade, but it can also be used to finance investments. It depends on, 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 on the, the exact instrument itself. Um, we also take part in, in free trade agreements negotiations. Um, so we have investment chapters within free trade agreements. We also have um, sometimes uh, chapters dealing with or negotiations dealing with trade and financial services, um, which is also um, a very important part of, of the legal framework, the treaty framework that we provide. Uh, but I can get into that a little later. So um, I'll start with the tax treaties. I'm, an, I'm not a tax expert, uh, expert. As I told you, we have our tax experts in the state revenue department. Um, but I can tell you that um, our tax treaties are basically uh, based on the OECD uh, treaty model. Um, of course, the, the full name of tax treaties usually is uh, treaty for avoidance of double taxation. So of course they used to uh, they are used to avoid being taxed in in both your uh, the country you originated from and the country you invested in. Um, I can tell you that we have just concluded a very important uh, negotiation on tax treaty with the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, and basically our the la the last two quarters of 2020 uh, with. Uh, within the government have been packed with activity concerning what we call the Abraham Accords or the Abraham Accords countries. And there was a lot of activity uh, uh, going on. Um, and, and so we had a, a lot of initiatives with the UAE. One of those, two of those, two of the pillars, two of the main pillars of, of creating the right kind of infrastructure or framework for investors, uh, Israel UAE wise, the two, uh, two of the most important pillars were ta a tax treaty and a bilateral investment treaty. We have concluded the, the bilateral investment treaty uh, negotiation in October, and we just concluded the tax treaty negotiation. And, and of course the tax treaty with the UAE as the majority of our tax treaties uh, of course, would prevent double taxation. It would decrease withholding, withholding tax rates on dividends and royalties and, and maybe some other, some other types of taxes. Of course, it would provide certainty and predictability and it, it would truly assist um, uh, creating uh, 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 an economic collaboration because a tax treaty, once it's in force, this is just money in, in the investor's pockets. Now the tax treaty with the UAE, which is our most recent one, just concluded. Uh, it wasn't signed yet. It, it will be signed in the next, hopefully, few weeks. Um, it would probably come into force 
uh, on January 2022. Uh, the bilateral investment treaty, which I'll get to in a minute, would uh, it, it was already signed, but uh, it will probably come into force um, hopefully within uh, the next few months. Uh, we're in the midst of a ratification process for that. So that's the tax treaty. It's really a kind of a general thing. Um, but um, by the way, you can look in the chief economist uh, at the Ministry of Finance website. We have a list of all our tax treaties. We have the text there. The same goes for bilateral investment treaties. You have the list, you have the texts, um, you have our emails, so you can reach us if you have any questions. So please feel free to do so. Um, now, with regarding to Israeli BITs, those are bilateral investment treaties. As I told you, that's my bread and butter. So, so I'll, I'll get just a little bit deeper into that and explain what we do here. So you can see this is our network of, of investment treaties. Um, uh, we have a lot of treaties with European countries, especially in the 1990s, um, uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union, there was uh, uh, a great, uh, there was a policy to, to you know, um, collaborate with all the European countries and the new independent countries. So we have a lot of agreements with those. We have a lot of agreements and, and that's a part of the government policy in recent years um, to, to uh, promote uh, agreement in Asia, but we go all over, all over the place. I see we have something in. Yeah, we go all over the place. Um, and if you have, if you're from a country who has an interest in, by the way, uh, I'm just saying that in, in promoting a new treaty, maybe an update to an old treaty even, we, we're willing to look into that. Of course, this year we're kind of fully booked, but we can plan for next year. And, and of course, we're always interested in new collaborations. Um, so what are bilateral investment treaties? Basically, bilateral investment treaties are, are, are treaties that set, uh, uh, set obligations, uh, state obligations towards uh, foreign investors. That means, and you can see here the main articles in our treaties. You see senior management and board of directors. That means that once a treaty is signed, the state cannot uh, uh, tell that foreign investor who to appoint for senior management or for board of directors, no matter what the nationality is, right? So if you're with our last, uh, our last uh, treaty that came into force is the Israel-Japan treaty. I will get to that in a minute. So for example, that's already in force. So uh, uh, if an Israel, it's a bilateral right treaty. So if an Israeli investor in Japan wants to appoint an Israeli to run its, the, uh, their business over there, they're good to go. The same for a Japanese investor. If they want to their board of directors to be uh, uh, comprised of, of people with Japanese nationality, not just Japanese, by the way, if they want German, or, or uh, Ethiopian or whatever, they can appoint those and the state would not interfere. Of course, each treaty like most international treaties have exemptions, we have some exemptions, but that's the basic rule. So of course we, we provide an obligation to assure free transfer of capital. Uh, we um, obligate ourselves not to expropriate unless for uh, certain purposes. And if we do expropriate for those purposes, we compensate, right? Of course, we, we have a non-discrimination clauses and, and one of the major, the, the truly major uh, instruments that this treaties have is a very uh, complex dispute settlement mechanism that allows not uh, a state to dispute against another state, but each and every private investor can take the state to uh, an international dispute settlement mechanism. That is a one of a kind dispute settlement mechanisms. It's only within investment treaties or with investment chapters in free trade agreements. And that is a, 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 a truly amazing instrument that is given only to foreign investors because basically you can, uh, on, 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 if you're claiming that the state has breached one of the obligations in the treaty, you can take the state, you can 
let go of the local domestic court system, judicial system, and go to international arbitration. And that's truly, truly uh, an amazing instrument. Now, um, what is it all good for, right? So, of course, um, Israel is a, uh, is a state with, uh, we pride ourselves to be uh, 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 practicing rule of law. And of course, and, and hopefully uh, we do not discriminate and so on and so on. Um, but still, this kind of treaties provide predictability, provide certainty. And of course, they tell the world that a state, Israel and the, 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 the state that, that we've signed with, are held to a high international standard that later on reflects in uh, international and indicators, such as uh, doing business at the World Bank or, or other indicators. And, and, and that provides uh, uh, both benefits for Israel, uh, for the state, uh, for other states, and, and, and it provides certainty and predictability for uh, investors. Um, you can see for the, I'm sorry, I'm focusing on the UAE Israel bilateral investment treaty, but that's, we just concluded it uh, a little while ago. Um, so this is just to quote what Minister Katz has said on it and the Deputy Minister of Finance uh, of the UAE. So Minister Katz says this, this is a part of a broad policy that we are leading in the Ministry of Finance and the government to promote international economic cooperation. This agreement will be a cornerstone for the consolidation of economic relations between the two countries with an emphasis on increasing investment and co cooperative ventures in the private sector. So, so definitely there's a diplomatic aspect to these treaties. It's not all uh, purely economic. There's also diplomacy here. And that is also sometimes really important, right? In establishing that, that uh, uh, relationship. Um, and and uh, I really loved what uh, Deputy Minister uh, El Khoury has said, this measure, this measure means this treaty uh, will strengthen the economic uh, and trade ties between the country, encourage competition, enhance the attractiveness of investments in two countries as part of the map of global competition. This measure will develop new paths for cooperation and finding solutions for global challenges. So it's really summarizing what our treaties are aimed to do here. Um, by the way, I skipped this. This is the, uh, the two uh, 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 signing events that we've had, the two, the two last ones, one in Tokyo uh, in 2017, the Israel-Japan Treaty, uh, and one just uh, six months ago here in Tel Aviv uh, with uh, Minister Katz. Uh, I was uh, gladly, uh, and I was proud to be in those uh, two events. Um, by the way, and I, I, was, uh, I wanted to talk about that, um, we're talking about COVID or post-COVID challenges. So when you're negotiating these kind of instruments, these kind of treaties, it's, it's, there's a whole new kind of challenges, a whole new kind of challenge. And in the past, you know, we used to travel uh, abroad a lot. Uh, of course, COVID has made that kind of impossible, at least for now. So we've switched to, uh, we've changed our way of thinking about negotiation and, and we've moved to a video conference-based negotiation, which seemed like a big challenge when we first started, but now we see it as, as, as actually uh, uh, as an opportunity to learn and use video conferencing as a way to increase our capacity. Because if you don't need to travel, the, you cut the cost, you cut the, the, the time, you're, you're um, spending on a negotiation and it's, uh, we think it could actually make us more efficient. You have here the, some pictures from our negotiation with, with the UAE. Uh, and this was uh, one of the greatest achievements we've had. We actually managed to complete a full set of negotiation within a week. I, I couldn't believe that was possible. I didn't believe that was possible. Um, but we did it. There was, a, of course, a lot of uh, what assisted us was a lot of uh, political willingness and polit some political pressure, um, uh, but we did it. Uh, in my mind, that was a great achievement. Um, so um, basically, that's it. Um, we also have at the Ministry of Finance other instruments, but these are the two 
main instruments that we promote and use within the chief economist department. We also have other instruments within the ministry. We have, of course, we are uh, uh, contributing to regulation. We have all sorts of regulations to promote uh, uh, to promote uh, FDI, uh, for example, uh, the law on encouragement, encouragement of capital gains uh, and, uh, and a lot of other regulations. But, but uh, this is, uh, these are unique instruments that we use and um, we believe that they are part of a broader policy aimed at promoting investments. And again, for the Ministry of Finance, it's not just inward investments, it's inward and outward investments, uh, which is crucial. Okay, great. Um, so, Boaz, thank you. Thank you. It was a very insight. It was very insightful to hear really how the government can support the foreign investors and also uh, protect them, so to speak, uh, from um, unwanted uh, disputes. So it's it's great. Uh, you have to be always unique and you have to be always innovative in order to uh, provide special tools and special protection for foreign investors and that will draw new investors to the country. Um, and now for the second part uh, of our roundtable, I'm welcoming Mr. Modi Shafrir, Chief Strategist at Mizrahit Fakhot Bank. Mr. Shafrir will discuss, as I said, uh, about the economic, economic trends in a post-pandemic world, again on the case study of Israel, and will give us insights about how to measure um, the economic relief of a country post-COVID-19 while presenting Israel as a study case. So Modi, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like uh, you to host, to give me the permission to host the, to share the presentation. No problem. We are taking care of it. Just a second. Okay. Okay. Okay, do you see now the presentation? Yeah. Yeah? Okay, cool. With the, with the slides or without the slides? Uh, without, just the slides themselves, we see them. Ah, cool, okay. Okay, uh, so thank you very much for hosting me here. Um, I will talk in the next 20 minutes, 25 minutes, about various of things regarding the local economy. First of all, we'll talk about anticipated uh, acceleration in local economic growth in the coming year in Israel. A couple of slides about this. Uh, the end of the lockdown and its effect on the labor market in Israel. Uh, I will further elaborate about uh, what Boaz just talked about, the FDI in Israel, and why I think on a macro perspective level, uh, it will continue to be a boom and it will continue to surge in Israel in the next couple of years. Uh, and how that would have, will affect and also already affecting the shekel in Israel. Uh, we'll talk about anticipated rise in the cost of living in Israel and how, why I think the Bank of Israel is also related for that and why I'll explain why, what I think the Bank of Israel should do for these days. And uh, then a couple of words about the local real estate market and the future, future of the interest rate uh, in Israel. Now, please feel free if you may have any question whether it's in the end or during the presentation, you can ask me uh, both three. <clears throat> now let's talk a bit about the economy. And, uh, we saw that after contracting uh, by 2.5% in 2020 uh, and by 6.5 in annualized in Q1, Israel economy is due to a significant growth in the next uh, two years, especially by the way, in the second quarter onwards. And why is that is because of the the surge anticipated in the private consumption in Israel, we already see it in the, in the credit card, card data, which I will show in, the, in a moment. The renewed increase in vehicle consumption, vehicle consumption was one of the main reasons for the sharp con contraction in Q1, that and the fact that we still had been in a lockdown during Q1. And the further expansion of the high-tech sector uh, export and also the traditional exports, we will also elaborate in a, in a moment. Now, you can see that after the third lockdown, the optimism of local consumer bounced uh, to record highs, actually, uh, in the, in the, of the past decade. You can see the con consumer confidence indices in Israel uh, after the end of the third lockdown bounced in April. 
and I'm pretty sure that they will continue to be as high as they are in the next couple of months. But not, that, not just consumer, also business sentiment uh, soared and bounced in the, recent, in the last couple of months. You can see here, this is the business tendency server, for example, by the CBS in Israel. Uh, now, I was talking about the private consumption, the surge of the private consumption. You can see that the surge in Q2 versus Q1 in credit card purchases in Israel in diverse various sectors, uh, just reasonable to see the sharp expansion of the tourism compared to Q1, which we were already still in a lockdown, and the sharp increase in, restu in restaurants, credit card uh, purchases. On the other hand, People are going out, so the food retailers, uh, credit card purchases actually declined in Q2 compared to the first quarter. Now, besides of the private consumption, we have uh, another factor that support the strong GDP and the strong growth in Israel in the next thing that will continue to support it is the high-tech sector in Israel. Now you see over here in the chart, the surge in high-tech export in Israel, which is also highly correlated, of course, to the NASDAQ index. As long as the NASDAQ index and the, uh, as long as global uh, technology in, in the world are thriving, then it's something that definitely supports also uh, net inflows to the FDIs in Israel and also the export of high-tech abroad. Now, this is the, something that definitely supports strong shaker. And just to give you a glimpse about the numbers and how it's affecting the local economy, just first of all, look at this chart. The quarterly investment, okay, to, of, uh, in local startups in Israel, just on the startup, uh, were more than $5 billion just in the first quarter of 2021. While in the whole 2020, which also was a record year, it was $10 billion. So we are talking about an average of $20 billion investment, a yearly investment just on local startups. It will probably decline a bit, but still the number is huge and something that definitely is something unique to Israel, as Boa said before. And now looking at the FDI, Yes, the FDI in Israel has bounced as opposed to the other economies in 2020. It's a trend that, as I see it, it will continue. We were more or less $20 billion FDI in the previous years. It bounced in 2020 to $25 billion. And as, as I see it now, you know, in the, on the macro perspective level, it's something that will continue to, uh, to increase. And why is that? Because as long as the liquidity in the financial markets will remain high, and now it's huge, the liquidity in the financial market, because of global economy, because of global central banks, the Fed, the ECB, other central, bar, central banks are just uh, injecting money to the system, and there is huge liquidity in the financial market. And as long as the NASDAQ index will continue to hover at its highs, just a glimpse or an indication for the global high tech, Okay, this is something that supports a strong shekel and continued FDI inflows into Israel. And why is that? Just think about global pension funds, for example, European pension funds, okay, who has tons of liquidity of other global uh, big tech uh, economy, uh, companies in the world, got huge tons of liquidity, and they're saying, okay, how much can we invest already in the stock market, in the real estate market? In the bond market, by the way, the bond market in, the, in Europe is a negative rate in almost all European countries, or most of the biggest European countries. If you invest, for example, in a Germany for 10 years, now after it increased a bit, you, got, you, you are getting nominal negative yield for 10 years. So if you are a European pension fund with huge liquidity, eventually you need to divert, for example, you need to divert your money also to private equities, and this is something that eventually come also to Israel to investing in the high tech and especially also in Israel, which is the startup nation. And this is why as long as this uh, global, you know, uh, thing will remain, which probably interest rates will remain low on the global perspective. They will increase a bit, but they will remain low. And as long as the Nasdaq index will remain high, this is something that one support a strong shaker. And one of the reason is this huge FBI uh, in, into Israel. Now, talking about the shekel, it's not just the FDI. It's the FDI, which is 4% of the GDP in Israel, but it's also the current account surplus. Current account surplus is also, also something that is structural 
on the surplus side. By the way, S&P, for example, credit rating, like this in Israel. They are saying, okay, the balance of payment of Israel, which is the current account and the FDI, is also always very positive. And this is something, a credit strange for the local economy of Israel. And you see that the surplus in the current account has been more or less an average of 3% of GDP. In 2020, it bounced to 5% of the GDP. It's another 20 billion. And, if it, and even if it declined a bit, in 2021, it's still more or less 15 billion a year. It's again, huge inflows. That's something that eventually supports a strong shekel. And this is the underlying forces that everybody's talking about. This is the current account surplus, the massive FDI inflows, something that supports a strong shekel in the long run against the currency basket. Now, another ex ex expression of the strong shekel, just think about what happened here the last week. Local economy, the figures for the Q1 was for a contraction of the local economy against expectations, by the way, the expectation were for expansion of the local economy of also in Q1, which is a negative indicator from the economy. And there was the fighting Gaza Strip in all of Israel. And despite of that, the ILS, the shekel actually appreciated by almost half percent against the basket last week. And you can see over here, this is the Israeli shekel. Okay, one of the best currencies against the dollar over the last five trading days. So this is another you know, expression of the strong shekel and the powers, the underlying forces that support this strong shekel. Now, besides of the, you know, the, those underlying forces, you also, also have local institutional bodies in Israel that are selling almost every month huge amounts of dollars. Now, you might ask yourself, okay, why local pension funds in Israel are selling dollars in huge amounts? And the reason for that is, is the fact that, you know, our pension funds in Israel now exposed to the dollar shekel, almost 20% of the assets is exposed to FX after hedging, meaning that in case, for example, stock market, global stock market arising, technically the uh, exposure to foreign assets increase and they're not, they, doesn't want, they don't want to, their foreign assets exposure to increase more because they're already at record levels. So this is why in those occasions when global market are rising, local pension funds in Israel are selling dollar. And in the last four months, in addition to all the FDI, and in addition to the current account surplus, they sold almost $10 billion, which is huge. And this is why, by the way, why you see the very high negative correlation between the NASDAQ index, you can see over here, and the dollar shekel, this is you know, appreciating on inverted side, the dollar shekel, shekel over here. Now, against all of these underlying forces which support a strong shekel, there is one thing that supports, you know, the depreciation, I might say, or maybe mitigating the shekel appreciation, which is the Bank of Israel FX program. Now, let's talk a bit about the Bank of Israel FX program uh, and whether it will continue in 2022. <clears throat> now, I, know, I don't know if you're, you're all aware that the Bank of Israel in the beginning of 2021, five months ago, initiated a huge unprecedented ethics program in which they say we are going to buy at least $30 billion a year, which is huge. And by the way, the reserve, the ethics reserve in Israel now are at record levels, very high compared also to international levels. And why did the Bank of Israel initiate this huge ethics program? This is because in the beginning of the year, lots of high tech companies, representative of those high tech companies sent a letter to the Bank of Israel, which is also public, saying that we are going to have thousands uh, of uh, layoffs in case the Bank of Israel will not intervene in the market. And also the Manufacturing Association also complained about the strong ship. So the Bank of Israel said, okay, we have very high unemployment. We don't know what will happen with the COVID. We still don't have the vaccination here program in Israel, so okay, at least we will support them by initiating these more than $30 billion in Israel, a purchase ethics program. By the way, until now, four months, until April, they bought almost 20 billion. And despite of that, the shekel did not depreciate since the beginning of the year. And why is that? All the fundamentals we talked about before in the local institutional body selling dollars. Now, <clears throat> On the other side of the coin, you know, the Bank of Israel is mitigating the shekel appreciation pressures. But on the other hand of the coin, I would say, you have, you know, consumers 
importers and other local businesses that are actually being hurt from this decision of the Bank of Israel to mitigate or to stop the shekel appreciation pressures because the shekel should be its actual level they should be three one against the dollar or even three against the dollar and they are they are, uh, they are heading they are definitely uh, don't like the bank Israel, the fact that the bank Israel is buying so much because specifically you can see in the past year you saw a surge in commodity prices prices global commodity prices and maritime transport prices are increasing and bouncing you can see over here and this is something that eroding their profitability okay now, assuming the shekel were three against the dollar or 3.1 against the dollar, definitely they, uh, their position were much better than they are now. And I'm not just talking about local import, big importers in Israel, I'm also talking about local businesses, small businesses in Israel, like restaurants, for example, which their material, their, the price of their materials are bouncing and they cannot pass through all of this to the local consumers in Israel. So they are definitely in a bad situation now these days because of the bank official decision to support the exporters. And we will talk, I'll talk about the exporters in a moment. And this is something that is leading to a surge in the raw material prices. You can see in the manufacturing industry, the PMI, purchasing manufacturing index, surge in raw material prices to record levels over the past decade. And this is something that increases the PPI, the purchasing uh, producer price index in Israel. And this is that eventually something that will go through in a smaller effect, in a smaller amount to the local consumers in Israel. You'll see imported inflation in the coming year. And what is the problem with that? The problem is that this is not a good, the good inflation that the Bank of Israel, I think, wants. And another problem is the fact that Israel, as you can see over here in this map, okay, this is the global cost of living map. Israel, you can see the red dots over here. We are super expensive country compared to the world. We are graded, unfortunately, the number eight in the cost of living, you know, global uh, index, uh, below, slightly below Japan, but it's, in Israel it's very expensive to, it's very expensive to live in Israel. And everybody who lives in Israel doesn't need this index to understand and to know that the cost of living in Israel is very high. And what the Bank of Israel is actually doing these days is instead of helping decrease the cost of living by, you know, uh, causing the shekel to not to appreciate like it should be, okay, especially in times of surging commodity prices and surging maritime and, uh, prices in the sea, they are causing the shekel to, you know, be artificially high, artificially low, okay, and helping the increase of the cost of living, okay, to increase the inflation to the target that the Bank of Israel wants, but the inflation can increase to the target even without those increase in the imported inflation, which is not good to Israel. Now you might say, yeah, but the Bank of Israel is supporting the high-tech industry. They said they, they are going to do it, and the high-tech and the local exporters in Israel are more in the low-tech industry. Now this is, uh, you know, something that I think they need to think about, because you can see what's going on in the high-tech in Israel. You know, every day the newspaper headlines just another exit, another, you know, global uh, giant corporation like Facebook and Amazon, uh, as well as local unicorns in Israel like NVIDIA have recently announced that they are going to increase their development centers in Israel and to recruit more uh, engineers in Israel despite of the strong shekel and because they understand that investing, invest, investing in local engineers in Israel and the local uh, local development centers in Israel is much more important than the strong shekel against the dollar. <clears throat> now, the high tech definitely doesn't need the Bank of Israel now these days to help them with the strong, uh, with the strong dollar compared to the shekel. Now, you, you may ask, okay, what about the traditional, the low tech? The low tech, by the way, also, despite the shekel appreciation, exports of goods of the traditional industries in Israel, which is the low tech, actually expanded quite significantly over the last 12 months. This is according to the CBS number, 6.55%. So even then, they actually managing the shekel appreciation by hedging. And one of the reasons, by the way, why the export is expanding is because the global economy is booming, and especially the manufacturing sector. You can see over here, this is the global manufacturer PMI, Purchasing Manager Index, which bounced recently to its highest level in more than a decade. 
So all in all, the bottom line, I think that the Bank of Israel should definitely will continue with its, 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 its ethics program in 2021, but I, th I think that it will eventually have to, uh, I don't know if to end it totally, but definitely to reduce the amount of purchase in 2022. Also taking into account the fact that the reserve, the ethics reserve in Israel is already a track of levels, already almost $200 billion, which is huge. <clears throat> now, before finishing, a couple of words about the local labor market and the real estate market. Local labor market, despite the anticipated accelerated acceleration in growth, still unemployment in Israel is very high. It's more than 10% the expanded unemployment uh, as of late April. Now, I and also the Minister of Finance believe that it will decline quite sharply towards the end of 2021, but it still will remain double, I think more or less, the level before the corona crisis. <clears throat> On the other hand, by the way, might strike the US, we have surging job vacancies. And why is that? This is because the unpaid labor it must be ended. Okay. Uh, for example, you can see in the hospitality and food industries, for every 100 workers, you have more than 18 available positions, which just give you a glimpse why the unpaid leave must end in June. This is according to our, our, our opinion. Now, talking about the real estate market in Israel, uh, we think prices will continue to go up. Uh, and why is that? First of all, you see a surge uh, in demand. You can see it through the mortgage data, which are breaking record level every month, as well as other service by CBS. Now, why demand is surging in Israel for the real estate? First of all, you've got significant natural growth in number of households in Israel, more than 55,000 on average are households every year. Second, we've got investors returning to the market. Finance Minister Katz last year reduced the purchase tax for investors and they see, they think prices will continue to rise and you see investors returning to the market, to the real estate market in Israel. You've got a reduction in the mortgage rate in Israel and I think one of the most psychological but most important thing now these days that driving demand in Israel is this first time home buyers giving up of waiting for price declines in Israel. They saw the biggest, you know, contraction on record in Israel over the past year. And they, everybody was, you know, lots of those young couple were waiting, okay, for some kind of disaster, some kind of contraction of, or depression in Israel, or uh, something that will reduce the real estate prices. And they saw, they saw that even in the pandemic, the real estate prices rose, okay? And in addition, this, this, in addition, they don't see any government uh, plan, clear plan for the housing market. So they are just giving up and entering back the market. This is something that definitely supports rising demand and rising prices, especially due to the fact that demand is rising, but in parallel, supply is declining sharply. You see the decline, more than 20% decline in inventory of new homes in Israel over the past year. And in the long run, okay, and this is something, a very important slide, you can see that the households growth, the total population, this is on a yearly basis, the gray bars are higher than the housing starts, which is the, the, this over here, almost every year over the past 20 years. So demand is higher than the supply also in the long term. And this is something that supports the real estate prices in Israel eventually. Now, finally, how will this support and how will that affect the, the interest rate in Israel? Uh, as, uh, we, we think that despite the, the acceleration of inflation in Israel in the coming year, mostly imported inflation, and this, the, despite the acceleration anticipated in real estate prices in Israel, the Bank of Israel interest rate is going to, going to remain low for a long time. By the way, uh, also Governor Aaron said it quite loud and clear over the last couple of months that the Bank of Israel rate is low for longer. Uh, we've been in this rate environment over the last six years, and I believe that we have at least two years two more years in which rate will be uh, very low in Israel. By the way, the market now actually expects that the rate, interest rate will be 0.4%. This is according to the uh, rate market in Israel. Now these days, they are trading more or less rate of 0.4 in the end of 2022. I don't think, by the way, the market is already pricing a rate hike in Israel before the US, which I don't see how that can happen in tandem with strong appreciation pressures on the shekel. But this is what the market is pricing now these days. 
Atit. Unless I'm willing to hear uh, questions or... Uh... By the way, I would say last, one last thing. We started to publish uh, both uh, the social media six months ago, more or less, both in the LinkedIn and Twitter. Uh, if you follow those uh, things about, especially about the local economy, but also the global economy a bit. Uh, so please feel more than free to, you know, to, to follow us over there. Okay. Can you can can you can you stop the sharing? Uh, ah, yeah. Great. So uh, thank you, Modi. Uh, you really gave us um, important indicators that will help us as ambassadors and foreign attaches recognize where our country uh, is going through a slowdown, economic slowdown, and then it is our job as the long arm of the country to attract investors. So we need those uh, key indicators to understand uh, the economic uh, landscape. And then uh, we should take initiatives. We should be innovative as ambassadors and foreign shares and use special tools and special roadshows to attract uh, investors as, uh, as much as we can, because it is part of our duty to help our countries economically. So thank you, Modi, for your uh, insights. Uh, if there are any questions, we'll be happy to answer. Uh, by the way, uh, some of you asked us for the presentations, so I'll check it. I'll check it with the uh, speakers, and I will let you know. And if it's possible, uh, we'll um, we'll give them to you. Um, that's it. I see there are no uh, there are no other, any other questions. So I'll uh, I'll conclude uh, with the, some final words. Um, Thank you for the, all the participants in this unique event, uh, for the tools and insights we learned today. We surely will, sh those tools will surely be useful for us in the upcoming uh, uh, months as we continue to recover of COVID-19 economic uh, implications. And I hope you'll, you'll find those tools um, useful to you as well. That's it. Uh, our time is up for today. Thank you all for coming and I hope to see you next time. Thank you all and goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.